You can go ahead and clap for that. That's uh... <laughs> that's just a little taste of uh, of the goodness that happens on our campus uh, all throughout the ministry year. We opened up a preschool for the community, and the community has responded to it. And we have a number of people, two classes going on right now, Tuesday and. And Thursday, and then one that's on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so we hope that you spread the word about Faith Community Church Preschool because we are a Christ-centered preschool teaching these kids about these things. Every once in a while, I get invited to go in the classroom and sing some silly songs and have fun, and it's always a great joy for me to do that. So spread the word about Faith Community Church Preschool. Um, Today, we're here at the end of a four-week kind of mini-series as we've been talking about Jesus being the prophet, the priest, and the king. And if you were here last week, you'll remember that I left us all on quite a bit of a cliffhanger. Uh, So I want to make sure that we go back and tell the rest of the story. But before I do that, I actually want to rewind back four weeks to recap all that what we've said in the series so far so that we're all up to speed together. So that way, if it's your first time here today, it'll be like you have four weeks of church attendance under your belt, all right? So four for the price of one, right? You're like, how long is this going to be? Well, how can you turn that down? Four for one. That's awesome. Um, In the promotion of this series, we said that the author of Hebrews, who is writing a book in the New Testament, confidently announced that Jesus Christ had successfully assumed, fulfilled, and continually upholds all three offices of prophet, priest, and king. Now, an office is kind of like a job. So kids... Um, You know what your mom and dad do every day, they go away like probably five or six, maybe even sometimes seven times a week, it's crazy, they work a lot, it's their job, all right? They have to do that usually five or six times a week in order to make the family work right, okay? And the office of prophet, priest, and king were given to Israel in the Old Testament to make things work right in their nation, and so there's these three different jobs that were to give, given to different offices, specific people. And the author of Hebrews says this, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed as the heir of all things. That's ruling language. That's kingly language. Through whom he also created the world. He, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Talk about king. And after making purification for sins, that's the work of a priest. He sat down, and once again, kingly language, at the right hand of the majesty on high. The author of Hebrews is saying, Jesus fulfills all these roles exclusively. And he fulfills all these roles like no one else and with no one else. And it's been our heart's desire as a church to talk about these different hats that Jesus wears for the last three weeks so that by this morning our hearts would burst forth in exuberant praise with great confidence and assurance knowing who Jesus is and what he has done for us. So let's recap what we've talked about. First of all, week one, Pastor Danny led us off and talked about how Jesus is the ultimate prophet, all right? Prophets were people who publicized messages from God to humans. Pretty important job, right? If you're a created being like we all are, the most important thing that could ever happen to us is is to have our creator communicate with us. And now from the very beginning, it was rather easy for this line of communication to flow back and forth from the creator to the created, and from the creature to the creator, as both the creator and the created commune together in the garden grounds of Eden. If you read the very first chapters of this book, it's beautiful. That's the way it was in the beginning. The Edenic paradise was astoundingly beautiful as they communed together, but sadly, due to the direct disobedience in Adam and Eve, that communication was disrupted. And so the creature was expelled from the creator's presence and they're kicked out of the garden, resulting in a chasm that was far too expansive for any communication to travel across. 
And so the creator gets busy creating again, and he creates a way for his messages to be carried across that chasm. And he makes messengers called prophets. They were like the mouthpieces of God, carrying his publicized messages. And guess what? Moses was one of them. Anyone ever heard of Moses? Right? Good. Some of you have. Now, Moses actually communicated quite a bit from God. If you would read the first five books of the Bible, we call it the law. They were written by Moses. But I think, and there's really important messages there, but I think maybe the most important message that he ever said was what we're about to read from the book of Deuteronomy, the fifth book that he wrote. And in this passage that we're getting ready to look at, Moses who may just be the quintessential prophet of the Old Testament. When I say that word, I mean maybe the most important prophet of God up to that point. Moses says to his listeners, listen to what he says. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Moses, who's like the most important prophet, says, look, you might be impressed with me, but there's actually one coming after me that's the real deal. Moses was pointing past himself to an ultimate prophet of God who would come and bring a final and ultimate word from God. And many prophets actually came and went. But eventually Jesus shows up on the planet And he starts communicating all sorts of things about God. And he travels around, and he teaches, and he gathers followers, and everyone marveled at his messages. And even from the very beginning of his public ministry, people from his hometown said things like this. They were astonished at his teaching. Why? Because his message, his word, possessed authority. This man, Jesus, had something to say. And during his ministry, many unique things happened, but something happened that completely set Jesus apart from all the other messengers of God. Because one day, Jesus goes up on a mountain to communicate with God, just like Moses did back in the day, and he takes along with him a couple of his buddies. He takes them up there, and all of a sudden, there's a voice that comes from heaven. Can you imagine this? A voice comes from heaven and validates the validity of Jesus' testimony, and it says this, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Whoa. And what we get here is Jesus was the ultimate final prophet that Moses was referring to way back in Deuteronomy 18. Moses says, there's actually one coming after me, and you must listen to him. And Jesus shows up on the scene, and the creator says from heaven, listen to him. So why should we be listening to someone like Jesus and not the great prophets of the Old Testament like Moses? Well, John tells us why in the opening chapter of his gospel. Because of Jesus Christ, he says, from his fullness, from the fullness that's in Jesus We've all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So here's the question, how good are you? How good am I at keeping every rule that has ever been given? Is anybody really good at that? No. Is anyone like saying, I just wish I had more rules and restrictions put on me that I could fail at? Does anybody like want to be on that treadmill for very long for your life? Do you want to be burdened by that law? Or would you rather receive some much needed grace and truth from Jesus? So by fulfilling the law completely and perfectly, Jesus actually has become our rest for us. And in these verses, John was indicating that Jesus was and still is the final word from God. And this is where it gets interesting because John continues his narrative. And a little bit later on in John's gospel, we read that one time Jesus started teaching in Jerusalem during the Feast of Booths. And you're like, what is that? What's the Feast of Booths? Well, it was like this massive party. 
It was this massive joy-filled celebration, public celebration, that took place at the end of the agricultural year. After they gathered and all the grapes and all the olives and all the produce was harvested in Israel, they would get together and dedicate a time to say thank you to God for all of the provisions of the preceding year. And it was this massive public just party and they're excited and celebrating. And look what John says. It says about the middle of the feast, like right in the middle of this, all this is taking place in the middle of that feast, Jesus went up to the temple and he began teaching. He began speaking. And the Jews, therefore, they marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning, which he has never studied? Like, how is he getting these messages to communicate to us? And look at how Jesus responds. He says, so Jesus answered them. He says, my teaching is not mine, but it is his who sent me. He, he's saying, I'm going to give you a message, but it's not mine. It's, it's from the creator. Jesus was claiming a prophet status, and the people knew it. But his message at this feast was so polarizing. Because John says this. Some people, when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. They're like, this is the dude that Moses was talking about. Like, this is the guy, this is the prophet. And some were on board with what this prophet was saying but four verses later there were some that weren't because it says some of them wanted to arrest him so polarizing what Jesus was saying some were on board and some wanted to throw him and his messages overboard but one thing is for certain everyone who heard his teaching walked away amazed and had to come to some sort of conclusive decision about what to do with him, because even that were opposed to him said this, no one ever spoke like this man. Jesus was and is the final word from and of God who was dwelling among us, and Jesus is the final and ultimate messenger of God, and this was week one of the series, and we must listen to what he has to say. So that was week one. Week two is that Jesus is the ultimate priest. On that week, I told a rather comical story. I told a story about a man who was suing Buffalo Wild Wings. (laughs) I can't even believe I just said that. Because he claimed that they were guilty of false advertising for selling him a boneless chicken wing that really wasn't made of wing meat of a chicken. Rather, it was made from chicken breast meat, all right? And the chicken breast meat that was breaded, deep fried, and served to him, according to the lawsuit, caused him, quote, to suffer injury as a result of the defendant's deceptive business practices, right? He's suing Buffalo Wild Wings because of false advertising because he ate something delicious, right? The alleged problem in the story was that in the plaintiff's mind, Buffalo Wild Wings was guilty of false advertising. He wanted the real thing. He wanted Buffalo Wild Wings to put in the time and the effort, the costly, time-consuming, and messy work of stripping all the meat off of each wing, then bread it, then deep fry it, toss it into some sauce. He wanted the premium meat, not, meat, not just some like chicken breast meat cut up to look like a wing meat, right? He wanted the real deal. Only the real deal would be worth paying for and consuming. And this reminded me of the work of the priests in the Old Testament. The role or the job of a priest in the Old Testament was to serve as an intermediary between a holy God and sinful people. A priest would actually act as a representative of the holy God to sinful people, and then they would also act as a representative of guilty people before the holy, true, and only God. And one of the primary ways they carried out this responsibility is by means of offering sacrifices. And it was hard to even do this study a couple weeks ago. Because when you start reading through what Moses wrote about the law, I mean, there is blood everywhere. It is a bloody scene. 
there's like blood sprinkled here, blood, blood sprinkled there, everywhere. And the reason why is because those animals were being slaughtered on behalf of sinful people. The humans who had sinned des- deserved to be killed, but God made a way for a worthy substitute to take the punishment on their behalf. And it was brutal, but it was necessary, and it sure beats the alternative of all of our blood being spilled. And they did this year after year after year. And so in the book of Leviticus, you read variations of a phrase that appears seven times. So the priest shall make atonement for him and for his sin, and he shall be forgiven. Now priests, listen, did all that hard, messy, bloody work, but it only provided a symbolic payment for the debt of their wrongdoings. It's interesting because in the Old Testament, it's never claimed anywhere that sins were completely taken away or completely removed by animal sacrifices. The root of the Hebrew word kafar is the idea of covering, not complete removal, like it's, it's still there, but it's just covered over for a time. And the author of Hebrews clearly states that all of this work and adherence to the Levitical law and the procedures that were being meticulously kept by all parties involved were, listen to this, but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. And so it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So all of that hard, messy, costly work fell short of the real deal and all of that work just pointed to the real deal that was to come and the real deal that was to come was Jesus one of the most shocking things that occurred during the earthly ministry of Jesus was what he said to the paralyzed man who was lowered in front of him from the roof by his friends while Jesus was teaching in a house because what Jesus says to this man is When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. What? Like everybody that was there would would just say, What? Like, did we hear you right? Everyone in that room must have gasped. Because the pronouncement that was pouring out of the mouth of Jesus in that public setting, in that moment, it sounded a lot like the seven-time repeated phrase that we find in Leviticus about atonement and forgiveness of sins. And so, unlike the Old Testament priests, Jesus made it clear that he is pronouncing divine forgiveness by his own authority. He was saying, look, I am God. And that's pretty hard to dispute. When the man who was once lying on a mat and was lowered from the ceiling takes up that mat and he walks out the front door to walk in a whole new way that he had never walked before. And this was possible because Jesus, as the ultimate priest, would eventually use his own capable legs of walking up a hill called Golgotha as a priest making an offering. But instead of his offering of some blood of an animal substitute, he offers his own instead in our place. And in this way, Jesus became both the priest and the sacrifice. He becomes the ultimate priest, offering himself. And this priest comes with many benefits. But maybe one of the best things about this new priest, this ultimate priest, is what the author of Hebrews says when he says, We don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect had been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Your God knows you. God knows exactly what you've went through this week. And he is not unable to sympathize with you. He is able to sympathize with you. And what a blessed privilege to be known and sympathized with by the holy God, once again, who created us. After we had infinitely offended him by our willful disobedience, instead of incinerating us, he sympathizes with us, and he invites us back into his presence so that we can, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Has anyone ever been in a time of need? 
Yeah. Has anyone among us ever needed some mercy in their life? Anyone ever needed some grace when you've messed up? And if we say yes to any or to all of these questions, I have good news for you. They're all available to you because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for you on that first Good Friday 2,000 years ago. It not only covers, but it actually removes your guilt and your personal sins away from you. So Peter writes this, he himself bore our sins in his body, your sins, my sins, in his body body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness oh and by the way by his wounds the wounds that you deserve to have on your body by his wounds you have been healed and that was week two and week three was that Jesus is the ultimate king last week we mentioned that in the old testament there was a king who was to come and that the new testament talks about a king who came and went Jesus said, I am that king. (laughs) The biblical authors actually explicitly portray him as that king. In multiple places in the Bible, we see Jesus called the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus confidently announces something that made his hearers' hair stand on end. Like, who is this guy? Because Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, hey, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He actually shows up proclaiming things like a prophet and he starts preaching messages about repentance like a priest. And he does all this and he says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. His message was starting to make some waves Basically, he says, hey, you're all wondering when the king spoken of in the Old Testament would arrive and bring his kingdom? Here I am. Talk about making quite a splash. So from the very beginning of his ministry to the final week of his ministry on Palm Sunday when we see little children crying out to Jesus, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Even the king of Israel, he was not shying away from being known as the king. And now to the cliffhanger part, and as we wrap up this message, we realize that no king becomes a king without some sort of recognized coronation and enthronement ceremony. And talk about quite a unique, one-of-a-kind ceremony. Because the prophet Isaiah spoke of this king who would be one who was despised and rejected. Here's the king, we'll despise him. Let's reject him. Let, Let him be known as a man of sorrows. Let him be acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces and not acknowledge him as king. And be despised and esteem him not. The enthronement ceremony for Jesus, connect for a second, was to be hoisted up on a rough hewn cross, mocked with a robe, and they put a crown of thorns on his head with a sarcastic sign that was hung above his head while he died a brutal public death on behalf of others and in front of his own weeping mother. How about that for a ceremony? Behold your king. Let's all reject him. That's what humans did. And I mentioned this last week because we just sang about it. The choir led us. When we cast our eyes on Calvary, when we cast our eyes upon that bleeding man on the cross, we must remember the words that he once uttered because he says, now is the judgment of this world and now will the ruler of this world be cast out and I when I'm lifted up from the earth will draw all people to myself how will he be able to do that if his cold lifeless body is buried in a borrowed tomb how in the world will this supposed king draw all people to himself when he lies silent in the grave Well, 
we're all here today for some reason. Maybe it's an Easter tradition for your family. You get all dressed up, you come to church, you listen to someone talk for a really long time, wondering if your lunch plans are going to be delayed, right? I get it. Maybe you come here every week just longing to be connected to other people and through fellowship and maybe hear a message from God as he communicates to us by means of his preached word. It doesn't matter if you're here for the first time or the hundredth time. We're all here now. And the real reason why every single one of us is here or watching online this morning whether we know it or not, is because this is the day that we set aside on our calendar year to remember the remarkable, historical reality that Jesus Christ did not stay in that borrowed tomb. This is the day, get this, that Jesus circumvented the ultimate human terror, our mortality, Jesus rose from the grave. On this day, many years ago, a group of mourning ladies expecting to see a corpse of their friend were greeted by an angel on that first Easter morning with these words, He's not here, for he has risen. You want proof? Come, see where he was laying He's not there anymore. Why are you looking for him, the living amongst the dead? And later on in that chapter, we read that Jesus, who indeed was alive, didn't just appear to be alive, but was alive, confidently encourages his first followers with these words, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's ruling language that is a force filled claim to supreme and absolute governance and dominion basically he's saying look there might be authorities in the world but I have all authority I may have been put to death under the authority of Pilate who was under the authority of the emperor and king Tiberius Julius Caesar Augustus but they didn't take my life in fact, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord, and I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. And by his rising from the dead, Jesus clearly demonstrates that not only does he have more authority than all the other authorities, but that he has all authority over every authority. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Jesus is claiming all authority. It's not an exaggerated overstatement because by his death and resurrection, Paul says this, he disarmed the rulers and the authorities and he put them to open shame by triumphing over them in the cross. Don't miss the irony here. Don't miss it. Where we would normally expect defeat by seeing a dead Jewish man on a cross. From that death came the disarmament of every demonic force in the known universe. Talk about a triumph. And he is able to take intentional acts of evil and turn it for the good of the world. So Paul says this in conclusion, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And all of this brings us to the end of our service today where we're actually confronted with some massive questions that demand answers. And this final song that we sing has some massive and loaded questions that must be answered in all of our lives. And as we sing the questions and declare the responses together, it's my heart's hope that all of our hearts would overflow in exuberant praise. We've been at this for four weeks now, leading to this moment to praise Jesus for being the ultimate prophet, for him being the ultimate priest who offered himself 
and to be ultimately the one who has all authority, even over death, and he is our king. So at this point, I want to invite the worship team and the choir members to go ahead and come on up here now. And congregation, consider these questions that demand to be answered, and then we will all stand and sing one final time. Look at what we're going to sing about. What is our hope in life and death? That's a big question. What is our only confidence? We love to place confidence in so many things, but what is our only confidence? We're finite people, so who holds our days within his hand? Your life isn't up to you. What comes apart from his command? That means you're not the sovereign of the universe. You're not the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He is what comes apart from his commands. That means he's in charge. And not only that, but what will keep us to the end? Massive, massive question. More questions. What truth can calm the troubled soul? We've all been acquainted with troubles. Man, troubles abound here. So what truth can calm those troubles? Where can grace and goodness be known? That's what we're looking for. Something that we don't deserve and something that's really good. Where can we find that? How about when we have fears arise in our life? Who can hold us and our faith in that moment when we're faced with fear? Who can stand above the stormy trials that we face in life? Like, he is like above the clouds, over the thunderstorms. Who stands above those stormy trials? And then who actually can send waves that will bring us nigh or bring us near to him so he can even use those intentional acts of evil against you and use them to draw you to himself where he can hold you and coddle you and love you and experience his grace and goodness? Where can we find that? And unto the grave, as we traverse through our whole life, and then we get to that moment of death, unto the grave, what shall we sing? We better know an answer to that question. And then, what reward will heaven bring? Talk about motivation for living life faithfully in this life. We need to know that. What reward will heaven bring? These are all questions that demand to be answered and the answer to each one of these questions orbits around the gravitational reality of Jesus being the final word from God, who himself bore our sins like a priest, and who sits enthroned as the King of Kings with all authority forever, because by his resurrection, he defeated death. So this is the truth, even if now you can't see it. One day when our faith becomes sight, when we see him for as he is, we will all see it. And we will all see it. And it will be a day of rejoicing for some. And some who have taken this message, just like those in John chapter 7, they'd say, yeah, thanks, no thanks. And they'll just throw that message overboard. And it will not be a day of rejoicing for you if you make that decision. But hopefully for all of us, for all of us in this room, we should start celebrating that now as we conclude our gathering here today with these words. Oh, sing hallelujah. Our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess that Christ is our hope in life and death. Let's stand as we pray and continue on in our final song. God, we thank you that Jesus has become for us the ultimate prophet, priest, and king, the one who brought the message of you to us, the one who intercedes on our behalf and does so forevermore by his one-time sacrifice of offering himself as a worthy substitute in our place. And we see that by his rising from the grave that our hope can spring eternal because he has been given all authority. That means even authority over death. And so for those of us that find ourselves in him and have him as our ultimate prophet, priest, and king, our hope can spring eternal 
as we confess now and forever that you and you alone are our hope in life and death. God, may we sing this song with exuberant praise this morning. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.